and this meeting is being recorded the introduction of the speaker and our speaker this evening is Sarah Bean Lenz who will be talking on the submarine mining establishment on George's Island which ran from 1873 to 196. Sarah is a principal and the senior archeologist with Boreas Heritage Consulting Inc. in Halifax, specializing in cultural resource management. Since completing her master's degree in history at St. Mary's in 2010, Sarah has undertaken a wide range of historical research and archeological projects throughout Atlantic Canada, with a special emphasis on working with various First Nations in preserving their cultural heritage across Mi'kmaq. Her work has been published in the Journal of the Royal Nova Scotia Historical Society, the International Journal of Maritime History, and the University of Edinburgh Journal. Sarah is an adjunct professor in the Department of Anthropology at St. Mary's, past president of the Nova Scotia Archaeological Society, and our immediate past president here at the Royal Nova Scotia Historical Society. So tonight, Sarah is presenting for us a cultural heritage landscape from 150 years ago, namely the highly secretive facility on George's Island used to manufacture and test early underwater mines right here in Halifax Harbor. Who knew? And before Sarah begins, I'm handing it along now, we have Keith Mercer in the audience. And Keith is with Parks Canada and has also been involved in this initiative. And Keith, I'm going to hand it over to you because I know you have a few words to say. Thank you, Lois. And, uh... And good evening, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be back here. I'm going to be brief. Uh, so I work with Sarah on, the, on this project on George's Island. I think I'm just as excited as everyone in the audience to, to hear about it uh, tonight. Um, I think, you know, from a Parks Canada perspective, uh, I'm just as excited that, that folks after many years, decades even, now have an opportunity to go over and see the island for themselves. And so the the, the uh, the built heritage and the and the stories you're hearing about tonight, you know, as of a couple of years ago, um, you were able to go over and see it, and it's, it's a long time coming. So we we encourage everyone uh, to do so. I believe uh, tours start again in uh, the second week of, of June this summer. And um, <clears throat> when I say it's a long time coming, I, I really mean it. I have a a colleague. I, I'll just back up for a second. I'm uh, the culture resource manager for Parks Canada in mainland Nova Scotia. I'm based at the Halifax Citadel, a uh, national historic site. And so when it comes to things like archaeology at our sites, I play a, a management role and things like that. I have a colleague at the Citadel, Dave Danskin, and uh, Dave's been at the Citadel since 1984. And he is fond of reminding me and, uh, and my colleagues the many attempts from within Parks Canada and the public to try to open George's Island to the public all of which failed for a variety of reasons over the years and decades. Um, you know, it's a place that's that's rich in history, you know, that was fortified within a year or two of Halifax being established by the British in 1749. It's rich in folklore. Uh, Sarah might get into that a little bit tonight, but I'm sure everyone's heard legends about uh, uh, George's Island. So, <clears throat> so it's a long time coming. And uh, I, I guess the other thing to get it, to get this place ready for visitors. Uh, and I don't think we're, we're quite there yet. We started making some investments. Uh, we built a new wharf uh, that can handle uh, boats that are bringing tourists over. Uh, so we did some, some underwater archeology span uh, for that. And we're cleaning up uh, what we call the, the, visit, uh, the visitor or landing area, which is what you see on your screen right now, the submarine mining establishment because this is where it plays, this is the place where visitors are going to walk off the wharf, the first thing you're going to see. And so we're trying to clean that up. We're trying to, uh, to build some new facilities. 
And we're also investing in interpretation. So this spring, we're putting out a range of products uh, on the island to, to help visitors learn more about the history uh, of the island, not just uh, its military heritage, which is obviously very prominent, but also working with stakeholders in a range of communities, including our Mi'kma and Acadian partners. So, um, so we're very excited. And uh, if you haven't been over there, I really encourage you to go. Uh, there's lots to see, despite it being a small island. Um, another thing I would say is that it's rich in archaeology. So I think we've joked amongst our team that it's hard to put a shovel in the ground over that place and not to find something. So that means that when it comes to building or, you know, renovations on built heritage or putting signs in the ground, we got to be uh, pretty careful. And so we, you know, in this, in this project, uh, we looked to, to Sarah and her team at Boreas Heritage uh, to undertake a field archaeology program in this area. And uh, despite it not being a terribly uh, old area, you know, you're talking uh, the late 19th century, uh, I think we found some surprises. And I think Sarah's going to uh, mentioned that tonight. So we are, um, you know, when it comes to our sites and it comes to a cultural heritage, we, you know, we we try to be very careful, and we feel like we're good in hands with uh, with Sarah and uh, her team's work with us on a range of our sites, not just in in Halifax at some of our military sites, but particularly in Kejimkujik, our national park. And so we've done some wonderful work together over the past five or six years. So that's really all I all I have to say. I, I really encourage everyone to go out and visit the island uh, if you have the opportunity. Um, and you'll get to see firsthand uh, exactly what Sarah is talking about tonight. It's the first thing you see when you walk off the wharf. There you go, Sarah. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, and thank you to the uh, Royal Nova Scotia Archaeology uh, the Royal Nova Scotia Historical Society uh, for inviting me to speak this evening. It's always, it's always an honor uh, to be invited to speak. I will start off by saying that I am not an expert on the history of George's Island, nor am I a specialist uh, in military history, and I am certainly not an authority on submarine mining establishments but I am an archeologist and I had the privilege of undertaking some archeological work with my team at Boreas Heritage, as Keith mentioned, on George's Island in 2020, as Parks Canada prepared to open the island for public visitation. And during this work, we uncovered and documented some buried historic features associated with the submarine mining establishment and had the opportunity to witness some aspects of the Highlands history that few will ever see. And so tonight, really what I wanted to do was to share with you uh, some of what we uncovered as some of these features have been reburied and will likely remain underground for the foreseeable future. So we had a small window of opportunity um, to excavate some of the features associated with the submarine mining establishment. Uh, those have since been reburied, um, so you can't actually see them, but I'm hoping that this evening I'll be able to share with you some of what we did see so that you too will know some of the secrets that are buried underground on the island. It's also my hope that this talk will encourage you to visit the island this summer and to better appreciate some of the historic structures you will see and won't see as you step onto the island. I know the first time I arrived on the island, uh, I saw buildings and, and ruins like you see on the, on the overhead shot in front of you right now, and I had no idea what it was that I was looking at. And so my hope is that if you do visit the island, in the near future that this talk will help put some context around some of those um, historic structures and archaeological ruins that you will see as soon as you step off the, war off the wharf uh, and have your first encounter with George's Island. I have to note um, that this talk has nothing to do with submarines. Uh, I know I had a couple of people who contacted me earlier today, excited to hear my talk about submarines. And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> 
this is about the submarine mining establishment. Um, so something quite different. But in any case, uh, while the history of George's Island is generally well known, the submarine mining establishment is not as well understood as other aspects of the island's past. This is partially due to the relatively short amount of time that the facility was in operation and partially due to the highly secretive nature of submarine mining technology in the 19th century. Very few records exist and sources are limited. Indeed, most records that did exist were likely destroyed after the mining establishment was abandoned and Halifax defenses were transferred to Canadian control. As a result, this talk is not based on primary research and the historical information that I'll share with you this evening is drawn primarily from the work of the late Terry McLean, who wrote the most detailed history of the submarine mining operation in 1991 and the late Earl Luffman, a former Parks Canada archeologist who excavated portions of the island in the early 1990s. But before I delve into um, the story of the submarine mining establishment, I think it's important to provide a brief historical summary of the island. But my... Slides are not advancing, there we go. The small island, approximately five hectares in area and rising 23 meters above sea level, was born over 10,000 years ago. As the ancient glacial, glacier retreated, it sculpted a teardrop drumlin made of rock, sand, and gravel and smoothed its northern end, which tapers in the direction of glacial flow. It emerged as a geological monument dedicated to the last ice age and has been a prominent landmark ever since. As an archeologist, I'm inclined to take a two-eyed seeing approach to my work in Mi'kma'ki. And I like to think of the island, not as static geography or a glacial deposit, but as an organic structure or a living organism that holds meaning and memory whose identity is transformed over time and with experience. On the island's use and meaning to the Mi'kmaq, I cannot comment, but it was a significant feature of the cultural landscape of Jibuktuk, the Great Harbor, and the white pine forest that surrounded it. To the Mi'kmaq, it is El Pakwikt, meaning water splashed on it by the waves a beautiful and expressive place name that speaks to the living landscape of Mi'kma'ki and perhaps hints at the, an identity defined by the endless movement and sound of the sea. The Mi'kmaq were certainly aware of the early European fishing fleets that frequented the harbor and French fishermen who arrived in the early 17th century dried their catch on the island with which they referred to as Ile Raquette or Snowshoe Island. For a brief time, it was also known as Ile d'Anville, named after the leader of the French expedition who was initially buried on the island before being removed to Louisbourg. And while we know very little about this relatively short chapter in the island's history, I think it's a fascinating period and represents the beginning of a series of events that would forever alter the island's identity. The perceived significance of the Mid Harbor Drumlin changed dramatically in 1749 with the arrival of the British and founding of Halifax. The island's identity would become firmly welded to the notion of military defense and El Pakwikt became a sentinel pressed into service by a new British Imperial Naval Station. The island now had a singular purpose, to prevent enemy ships from gaining access to the inner harbor. Although the fortifications, artillery and technology required to fulfill its duty changed over time, its military directive 
and primary objective remain constant. As Halifax grew in importance, both economically and militarily, it became the object of attention for the latest and best British defense technology. But that attention depended on the perceived threat at any given moment. And Halifax's defense system, including George's Island, often fell into disrepair and ruins during times of relative peace and security. The first fortifications were constructed in 1750, and the first English passengers to arrive in Shibuktuk disembarked on George's Island, or on George Island, actually, uh, named after King George II. It's my understanding that the S that makes it George's Island uh, was not officially added until 1963. It was used as a base from which to begin construction of a new fortified town, and the early settlers were accommodated in tents along the island's northern shore. Soon thereafter, they were joined by foreign Protestants who lived in barracks alongside Irish laborers and assigned the task of constructing buildings and other structures, some of which were quickly transformed into prisons. Between 1755 and 1763, the island served as a site of detention and incarceration for large numbers of Acadians. And according to historian Ronnie Gilles Leblanc, approximately 1,660 Acadian prisoners were held on the island during the deportation, with a maximum of 600 prisoners at one time. Those interred on the island suffered perhaps more than any other group from inadequate facilities and difficult living conditions while awaiting deportation. And I think uh, now is perhaps a good time to insert some archeology. span So our initial task was to shovel test the beach at the northeastern end of the island where the existing wharf is located today. This is known as the landing area because it has a gentle slope toward the water and is protected from ocean swells being on the lee side of the island. An analysis of historical mapping suggests this may always have been the preferred way to access the island and the best location to unload supplies and materials. Shovel testing includes the manual excavation of 50 by 50 centimeter holes on a grid at regular intervals, and in this case, every 2.5 meters, and provides the archeologists with, it, with uh, subsurface snapshots intended to gain preliminary information or data on what may or may not be buried underground. And this was some of the most challenging shovel testing um, that we have ever undertaken, simply because we were digging through uh, a beach and all of the cobbles and rocks and material that comes with the beach. So it was really, really difficult um, for, for our crew uh, to actually dig these 50 centimeter holes to get some information about what might be underneath them. And the material itself, the beach material was also quite unstable once you start to dig into it. And so oftentimes, you know, the, the, the sides of the units would collapse and you'd have to start all over again. In any case, during the first phase of our shovel testing program, we identified a wooden feature immediately southwest of the existing wharf. And the photo on the right shows the very first evidence of this emerging feature. It was initially impossible to know what exactly we had encountered, but it seemed to be relatively large, and we noted its presence across the area adjacent to the existing wharf. In order to get a better view of the feature and to begin to understand what in fact it was, we expanded our archaeological excavation and removed a significant amount of beach and underlying fill deposits by hand trowel. And as you can see, what began to emerge were the remains of a well-preserved historic war feature. Once exposed, the feature measured approximately three meters wide by 4.5 meters long and was in rem a remarkably good state of preservation with elements of the decking still visible, albeit deteriorating. 
And the presence of this feature came as a bit of a surprise, mostly because it extended further inland than historic mapping implied. And we now had to assign an approximate date to this curious structure. The first large wharf was constructed on George's Island in 1778, likely associated with improvements prompted by the American Revolution. And the initial structure seems to have been, had to have been maintained for many years. It is detailed on DeBar's chart of Halifax Harbor circa 1784, and on a map dated 1795, which illustrates a rectangular shaped wharf, approximately 6.4 meters wide and 37 meters long. It was during this period, Prince Edward, son of King Edward III, served as commander in chief in Halifax, and under his direction, Fort Charlotte was completed in 1798. This wharf remained in use as tensions leading up to the War of 1812 caused another round of fortification building on the island, during which time the Star, the Star Fort and Central Blockhouse were leveled and replaced with a Martello Tower. Historical records indicate by 1839, the wooden structure was rotten and in need of attention. And in 1843, it was repaired or replaced. Almost 20 years of the wharf was again for upgrades between 64 and 1873. A drawing of the island dated 1877, which is on your far right, depicts this new wharf, a larger L-shaped structure, which seems to be associated with the implementation and operation of the submarine mining establishment, which lasted from 1873 to 1905-06 and a modified version of this wharf reduced inside, eventually morphed into the existing footprint where the new wharf has been constructed. We did not find any artifacts associated with this feature. Uh, we did find a 1964 Pepsi can <laughs> that was deposited onto the fill uh, on top of the feature. So we know that it had, it must have been exposed um, at some point in recent history, but there was no information um, related to the actual feature itself. Oops, excuse me. But the in situ hardware and nails and the general shape and size of the boards used to construct the wharf suggest it likely dates to the turn of the 20th century. It was decided that the wooden feature should be preserved as construction and modification of historic war features reflect the expansion and change in use of military facilities on the island. And it is quite likely that elements of those earlier war structures were integrated into later construction. And on the right, you can see the underlying crib work, which is indeed quite robust. Uncovering this feature la left a lasting impression on me. One, it was my first archeological encounter with an aspect of the submarine mining establishment. And two, it allowed me the opportunity to reflect on the island's history and the experiences of those who came before. And it came as a bit of a surprise that this relatively insignificant feature um, might be the catalyst for my understanding of the history of George's Island. Every individual who has landed on the island has arrived by some sort of watercraft. There may have been a couple of people who have swam over to the island, but um, I don't recommend it, and I don't know anything about that. But most will have accessed the island um, by some sort of watercraft and by way of this natural landing area. Whether you were a Mi'kmaq coming to El Paquit, a French fisherman, a British soldier, European settler, Acadian visitor, or Acadian prisoner, or a modern visitor, we all share in this experience of passing through the landing area, gifted to us by an ancient glacier 
that smoothed the island's northern tip. The remains of this wharf offered me a tangible portal into the past to think about that shared encounter, but also to consider how different this experience must have been, depending upon the circumstances of your arrival. I can't help but think that many people who took their first steps on the island did so with significant amounts of fear, apprehension, and uncertainty, perhaps none more so than the Acadian prisoners. And this was reinforced as I watched the first public visitors arrive in 2020, bubbling with excitement and a sense of adventure. But archeology span can be very powerful in this respect because it can create an immediate relationship with the past, with the land and with the landscape that changes your understanding and experience of a place. For me, this is not just the remains of a wooden wharf. For me, this is a memory, a single element of the island's past that was built upon earlier memories, events and experiences. And from that moment on, every time I approached the island and every time I walked across the new wharf, I was reminded of the people who had done so before me and my connection to them. Our wharf remains have since been capped and a ramp extension to the new wharf has been constructed above. So you won't actually get to see um, the remains of that feature when you do visit the island. But although you can no longer see the older wharf, it is my hope that by sharing this small, relatively insignificant feature, that those of you who will visit the island in the future will too be reminded of this shared encounter with those who came before you that you will be able to tap into the island's memory and that it will enhance your experience as you arrive on the island. So this brings us to the submarine mining establishment, which was of course located at the landing area and the first structures and ruins that you will see when you step off the wharf. And all of these are associated with the submarine mining facility. As I touched on earlier, Georges Island is a cultural landscape that reflects centuries of change in military strategy and defense technology. In the late 19th century, the rapid pace of weapons development brought significant changes to the island's defense system. In the 1870s, the batteries and fortic fortifications were completely rebuilt with the introduction of sophisticated rifled muzzle-loading artillery and reinforced by the threat of attack during the American Civil War. But by 1900, the RML guns were considered obsolete and a new defense strategy was necessary. As a result, in 1873, the British established a manually operated submarine minefield across the Harbor Channel and a submarine mining facility on George's Island to manufacture and assemble mines for placement in the waters off York Redoubt, Ives Point, and the Point Pleasant Peninsula during times of crisis. This high-tech military complex, one of the earliest constructed in the British Empire, was considered cutting edge technology, and the introduction of this facility placed Halifax at the center of military activity in the North Atlantic. George's Island was chosen because it was afforded the protection of, of Fort Charlotte's coastal, coastal artillery, the gun cover being necessary to, to safely prepare, load, and store the mines. But all, also I would suggest that the island provided the required secrecy that was necessary given that it was inaccessible at the time to the general public. And the mines enhanced the capability of existing guns by forcing approaching ships to slow down or stop when nearing the harbor defenses, thereby increasing their vulnerability. Mines can be loosely defined as charges of gunpowder or gun cotton of various weights enclosed in watertight cases of iron and placed underwater so that when detonated, they would sink or seriously damage any vessel in their vicinity. 
In Halifax, they were fired by electrical contact from the shoreline, which allowed friendly vessels to pass unharmed when necessary. The mine was loaded, primed, and made watertight in advance on George's Island. It would be connected up, meaning attached to a sinker, um, and then slung by crane on the wharf to the side of a vessel, which would proceed to the minefield and drop each mine in its correct position. The inner minefield would extend from Point Pleasant to include the Inner Harbor Passage and Northwest Arm, and the outer minefield was to extend out from York Redoubt to close the outer entrance of the harbor. The actual preparation and laying of mines in the event of attack was to take eight days, and the lines were not laid until attack was imminent. And this attack, of course, never came. The various components of the mining establishment were arranged in sequence from the pier head crane along a tramway to a variety of structural facilities, all enclosed by a security fence. Now all elements were in place on the island by 1878 and expanded in the late 1800s. The submarine mining establishment developed in two stages, stage one from 1873 to 1877, which focused on construction of the mine factory at the Northern end of George's Island. The buildings were of wood and concrete construction, uh, although none of those remain intact. And stage two focused on construction at York Redoubt and Fort Ogilvy. However, further development on the island included the erection of more per permanent brick and concrete structures between 1888 and 1893. And there are in fact, six remaining structures on the island from this second developmental phase. All extant buildings associated with the submarine mining establishment on the island are date to the period between 1888 and 1901. And the remainder are archeological features uh, which may or may not have some visible foundations. So what I'd like to do now is actually give you a little bit of a virtual tour of the submarine mining establishment so that when you do go to visit on the island and you first encounter these ruins and buildings, you'll have some idea of what they, of what they represent and what function they played in this submarine mining facility. So we've already covered the wharf uh, where supplies were loaded by crane or hand, uh, but just, just remember that the wharf itself is a really crucial component of the operation itself. And all things sort of um, center around the wharf um, because of course it was perhaps one of the most important features where the mines could be loaded onto vessels um, and, and transported to the minefields themselves. And once on land, the supplies were loaded onto a tramway system, which connected all components of the submarine mining establishment from the Southern torpedo stores to the Northern gun cotton tanks. So you can see I've just uh, indicated in yellow where that tram uh, was that tramway was laid, and of course it went out to the to the wharf as well. But it follows the entire extent of the submarine mining establishment, and is indeed that aspect of the of the establishment that connects all of these separate yet integrated features. The eighteen inch track began at the wharf, and branch lines and turntables serviced the operation. And some of these um, track lines are still visible today, as you can see on the photos on your left. The track is especially visible um, in the area of what was known as the connecting up shed, which I will discuss shortly, as well as the remains of one of the turntables in the loaded mine store, which is the area that you see in the photograph here. But we also, during our excavations, uncovered the remains of another turntable. 
Uh, and you can see that turntable uh, in these images of our excavation. I don't actually know how many turntables there were. Uh, there were certainly two uh, and perhaps an additional third one as well. And it's also a good time to mention that in addition to traditional archeological methods, recording methods uh, that we employed during our excavations, we also documented all aspects of our excavation with what's known as a global navigation satellite system. And you can see on the bottom right, uh, Steve Garson, my business partner, uh, using the GNSS, which is essentially a high precision GPS that can accurately record points with sub millimeter accuracy. So every feature that we uncovered uh, and all of the archeology span that we did was both recorded manually by hand in a traditional sense that with, um, with drawings and, and profile drawings and so on with photographs, but also with this global navigation satellite system. So I'm going to start our virtual tour at the southern end of the facility where the torpedo stores and cable tanks were located. So essentially this is where the general activities of the submarine mining establishment took place, such as prepping materials, electrical work and carpentry. The concrete cable tanks, which you can still see today, were used to source submarine uh, cables in water. And the building in which the torpedo stores was originally was building, built in 79, the top level, which six officers and 92 men. It was converted to the torpedo shed in 1873 and in fact became the largest building in the submarine mining complex. Today, all that remains is the concrete foundation of both the barracks building and the converted torpedo shed, which you can see on the bottom left. And this, as I said, sorry, I'm getting a really bad echo. Is anybody else getting that echo? Okay, I think it's I gone. Did. I think I think someone had their my, microphone unmuted, and I think I fixed it. So I, it, just a reminder for everyone to keep their microphones off while Sarah's talking. Thanks. So um, as I said, so we're starting at the southern end of the submarine mining establishment. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't think that visitors can actually access this very southern end uh, portion of the, of the mining establishment. At this point in time, I may be wrong, but I think at the moment it's off limits, but um, you can still see the concrete foundation, which is all that's left today. And you can certainly see it uh, from the water. Immediately north of the cable tanks, was the engine hose, likely used to power the tramway. At some point, perhaps during the second phase of construction, this building became a smithy and carpenter shop, a simple unadorned red brick building with a low pitched gable roof and a chimney at the southeastern end. It seems also to have been converted into a storehouse, perhaps around 1885. But these are photos of the extant structure and you can see the cable tanks in the foreground in the upper left photo. And this building, um, you can certainly see uh, when, you, when you go to George's Island today. Again, I'm not sure if you're allowed to venture that far across the mining establishment, but you can certainly see it from the wharf. Mapping also shows a cookhouse and barracks next to the engine house but nothing above ground remains of these structures. They were, however, essential to the facility uh, as it was operated by up to 60 Royal Artillery gunners and three officers from the Royal Engineers supplemented by up to 48 trained civilian auxiliaries. As we continue north um, along 
the tramway, we come to the coal shed, another one story red brick building with a low pitched gable roof and brick chimney. And this is the first standing structure that you will encounter uh, as you walk off the wharf. The structure was also built during the second development phase, probably around 1890. And given that few buildings associated with the submarine mining establishment are still extant, this is a highly significant feature. And I said the first, the first standing structure that you will encounter. It apparently served three functions as a guard hose, fire engine hose, and coal storage. And the existing building is likely a modified and expanded version of the original. And for what it's worth, this structure also served a fourth, in my opinion, very important function that you will not find on any map or in any history book. It served as an archeological tool storage facility and rain shelter for myself and my team. And indeed it was the base of our archeological operation. You'll also note on this map of the, uh, a, a map from 1900 showing the second phase of development um, of the facility the remains of a second cable tank built in 1890. And those remains you can certainly still, still see today, represented by a concrete floor surrounded by concrete walls about five meters high. And I'm going to skip over for a moment, um, several of the central features of the mining operation, because I'm afraid that if I talk about them now, it might confuse the sequence um, of the operation itself. So I'm going to skip over the connecting up shed, the sinker shed and the loaded mine store just for a moment and um, move over to the loading shed. So this is a, a photograph of the loading shed. And if you remember um, that photo of the mine with the watertight iron cases, well, this is where those empty mine cases were stored and picked up to be transported to the gun cotton tanks where they were loaded with explosives. On the left is an 1877 photo of the loading shed, which no longer exists, but you can see the tramway running in front of the building. And from the loading shed, the empty mine cases were taken on the tram to the gun cotton tanks where, explo where the explosives were loaded. Gun cotton was a replacement for gunpowder and the preferred explosive beginning in 1860. It was prepared by saturating waste cotton in a formulation of nitric and sulfuric acids and was considered the first stable, smokeless and reliable propellant which was safer to store because it was non-explosive when wet. And gun cotton was only superseded with the introduction of dynamite. The gun cotton tanks are the northernmost features associated with the submarine mining establishment. The first tank built in 1873, which can still be seen today, if you take a right when you first, uh, when you first step off the wharf. And you can still see the concrete traces of the second tank as well, which may have collapsed or have been infilled. Another feature that you will see, which is associated with the submarine mining establishment, uh, you'll encounter as you walk up the path toward Fort Charlotte, and that is the dry primer store built around 1890. The primer is a device that contains a particular kind of explosive compound that could be detonated by electrical charge and the primers were needed to uh, actually ignite the gun cotton. Only the wall structures of the dry primer store remain today, but it's a really cool feature. And when I first, uh, when I first had the opportunity to walk inside, uh, I, I had no idea what this particular structure was used for. I don't know if you can see uh, the presence of Gitbu. Uh, on the chimney in the building behind it. Uh, but many days when we were excavating out on the island, we were visited by this great bald eagle. 
So we'll now move back to the central portion of the submarine mining establishment. Um, so once the mines were loaded with gun cotton, they were transported to what is known as the connecting upshed, where cables, fuses, and electric apparatus would be connected to the loaded mines. A later sinker shed was also constructed directly in front of this building, where sinkers were attached before transport of the loaded mines to the wharf. And you can see um, the addition of the sinker shed on the map on your right-hand side. These two features were integral to the facility and the tramway ran through the center of the connecting up shed. This 1877 photo of the original connecting up shed, I think shows the sinkers in the foreground. And again, you can see just a portion of that tramway uh, running in front of the building. This building, um, as you can see, is now in ruins in the photographs uh, on your right, but they are very noticeable um, as, it, as this building sat in the center of the landing area and is very visible as you pass by. The loaded mines were then stored in a casemated mine store adjacent to the connecting up shed, which is highlighted in red here. And this building was erected before 1900 as part of the second phase of construction. The original mine store was designed in 1866 and can be seen through a doorway in the southern end of the remains of the later building. So you can see on the right hand side that white door that leads to the um, to the original casemated mine store. This building um, too is now in ruins and is at the moment unstable and unsafe, but again, clearly visible to visitors directly in front of you as you step off the wharf. And this is a photograph of that loaded mine store building before it fell into ruins. I'm not sure when, I'm not sure the date of this photograph and I'm not sure exactly uh, when it really collapsed and fell into ruins again, but this gives you an idea of what the superstructure looked like before it collapsed. So now I'm gonna turn your attention to the sinker shed. Uh, which, as I mentioned, is where um, they loaded and uh, is where the loaded and now connected mines were attached to sinkers so that they could be placed underwater. And this is what the sinker shed area looked like before we began our archaeological investigations in 2020. The only surface feature you could see was the concrete derrick base used for hoisting material onto the tramway. And you can see it there again, highlighted in yellow. I haven't been back to the island um, since the sinker shed area was capped. So I don't know if this concrete derrick base is still visible, but I suspect that it is. And as you've seen on um, this structure is depicted on historic mapping and was previously tested by Earl Luffman. So we knew the remains were there underground, but it was our job to excavate and expose the feature in preparation for capping and conservation. So after shovel testing this area, we began our excavation of the structural remains of the sinker shed. Uh, it took months, really, um, to do all of the shovel testing and to expose the remains of, of the sinker shed, but it, it was also really, really rewarding uh, and, and pretty exciting. This is a drone shot of the completed excavation of the sinker, set, the sinker shed structure, showing the brick foundation, portions of concrete floor, a stone drain, I can actually think, if you can see my mouse, um, this is the brick and concrete foundation, 
portions here of the concrete floor, uh, a stone drain that runs in this area, the turntable that I showed you previously that uh, is connected to the tramway, concrete pillars. Um, there's a series of three rows of concrete pillars across the sinker shed floor. And the derrick base uh, that I mentioned before, the concrete derrick base in the center of the sinker shed structure. The tramway originally ran between this building and the connecting upshed that I mentioned earlier, but was, and it would have run right through here, uh, connecting to the turntable and then moving into the connecting upshed. But um, we didn't excavate this area because uh, we knew that the tramway in this location had been previously removed to install and facilitate drainage on site. No photograph of the sinker shed building exists to my knowledge. But I assume it had a wooden superstructure, much like the connecting upshed. The loaded mines now attached to the sinkers were then hoisted onto the tramway with a crane that sat atop the concrete derrick base and were transported from this facility back to the wharf to be loaded on vessels and taken to the minefields. But I really wanted to share this with you, this, the, the remains of the sinker shed because they've since been capped for their protection and are no longer visible on the surface. But as you walk along the wharf, all you have to do is your right, uh, and you will know uh, that the sinker shed uh, is still there lying beneath the ground. In addition to all the artifacts you would expect to find on a site that has been occupied since 1749, like musket balls, ceramic fragments, glass, nails, et cetera, we recovered some other interesting items. We found a selection of British gun flints that you can see on, on your left, and many um, fragments of tobacco pipes. The ones on the photograph on your right uh, were all imported from Scotland, as well as two stamped copper alloy military buttons. The one on the right is from a Royal Regiment of Artillery uniform with a crown over three guns which was undoubtedly lost by one of the 60 Royal Artillery gunners who were working at the submarine mining establishment. We also recovered a variety of these copper alloy tags um, of which I'm just showing you uh, really a sample of what we, are, what we recovered. Um, I don't know the purpose of these tags, um, but I assume they were associated with materials used for the submarine operation. If anyone knows, I know there's some uh, military historians in the audience. If anybody does indeed know what these were attached to, I would love to know. And finally, perhaps my favorite discovery dog prints in the concrete floor of the sinker shed. I love the juxtaposition between the immovability of the concrete and the movement of the dog, captured, um, you know, capturing a moment in time that I imagine came with a certain amount of shouting and no doubt profanity. And I love this drone shot of the landing area because it really emphasized the compact and interconnected nature of the buildings that were part of the assembly line that, linked, that were linked together by the tramway. So you can see we have the new wharf ramp uh, just recently constructed and the one that you will walk down as you um, arrive on the island. And we now know that underneath this wharf ramp, uh, there is the remains of previous historic wharf structures. There is, as you walk directly in front of you, you will see the loaded mine store or the ruins of that building here. And in this case, you can see um, one of the 
turntables in that area. There is another one right here, and I suspect it's not the complete turntable. It's just a it's just a portion of it. Uh, but I suspect that there was likely one in this location, given uh, the nature of the tramway and the existing buildings that it connected to. Um, you can see the connecting up shed, which is here in this location. Uh, and you can see how the, the tram line and the, the track um, would have come through the loaded mine store. It would have made a turn at this turntable and continued into the connecting up shed, moving through this facility where it encountered another turntable that leads directly to the sinker shed. Uh, again, there would have been a track that ran through in between these two buildings. Uh, this area, of course, it's been removed. It may be, there may be elements of that track still in this area, but we did not encounter it uh, during our shovel testing program. And then of course you can see the top of the coal shed slash archeological tool storage facility uh, here, as well as um, the, the second concrete cable tank that you can see on the upper right of the picture. But this drone shot really gives you, um, gives you an idea of those first buildings and ruins that you will encounter as soon as you um, as soon as you come onto the island. And they're all associated with this highly secretive submarine mining establishment. And this is a broader view of the establishment, um, or actually the entire operation. With the 1877 plan that we've been seeing throughout this presentation overlaid on top. It shows not only the buildings that we've discussed that are still extant, but also those buildings that are no longer standing. Although there may be archaeological um, resources associated with them. So again, um, just to Run through this once more, we have at the southern end of the establishment, the torpedo shed, um, which was the military barracks, which, was, which is now just a concrete floor. The cable tanks right next to it. The engine house, which became the Smithy and Carpenter shop. That building is still extant and is um, a brick building that you can see. Next to it was the cook house and the barracks of which there are no remains above surface. The second cable tank, concrete cable tank here, the coal shed slash archeological tool shed um, is next to where the barracks would have been. And then you have the connecting up shed in this area, the loaded mines, the ruins of the loaded mine store here, which again, go underground in the, the casemated portion of it here. You cannot see on this air photo because at the time the sinker shed had not been exposed, but we now know that the sinker shed sits underground right here. This area I didn't actually discuss, but this was where there, it was the location of a former boat shed. And in fact, there was um, another sort of um, wharf structure that led down um, to provide access to this boat shed in this area. We did actually, I don't have a picture of it, but we shovel tested the, the area of the boat shed and did in find, we did in fact find some intact wooden flooring. So it may well be that elements of the boat shed still exist underground. In any case, we then um, have of course the tram track uh, moving throughout and connecting the facility, moving down across into the wharf feature uh, that was really, really critical to the entire operation. This is the pathway that leads you up to Fort Charlotte. Here you'll find on your right hand side the dry primer storage um, structure, the loading shed that we discussed that there's no longer any visible remains. 
And of course, the remains of the two gun cotton tanks, uh, one of which you can still see, um, it's still in situ, uh, which is the westernmost gun, cotton gun pit. And the I believe that was also the earliest one. So this is the entire submarine mining facility that existed on George's Island, at least the primary um, structures that were associated with it. There are a couple of other tanks and wells and sort of ancillary structures that, that still exist, but these are the primary buildings and features of the mining establishment. There were, uh, in fact, I think there still are elements of the mining operation that are that you can see at York Redoubt. I haven't gone to see them myself, so I don't know what they look like, but I believe one of those that is associated is the um, observatory um, at York Redoubt. The submarine mining establishment operated until 1905-1906, as I said, when the island's defenses were transferred from the British Navy to Canadian control and the operation was abandoned at that time. The minefield remained in place until 1918, uh, at which time it was seen as hazardous to modern shipping and it too was abandoned. And as you can see, there is still a lot of evidence on the island of the mining establishment and it, in, it occupies the landing area where visitors have their first look at features, at the historic features of the island. Just before I wrap this talk up, there are a couple of other, well, I, before, I, before I move on, I just, I hope that this gives you um, some context for those historic buildings and for this highly secretive submarine mining establishment, which most people really don't know very much about, if anything at all. Um, that existed on the island during um, during that latter part of its function as uh, as a defensive place in the harbor. So before I finish, I'll mention two other components of the project uh, that we the archaeological project that we did in 2020. Uh, I'll just go back. Actually, if you notice. Um, I don't know if you can see, but right here is the seawall, the existing seawall. And this ran across this entire portion of the island um, and really protected, protected the military features on the island uh, from the waves and the sea. Uh, it once ran the full length of the beach but a portion of it appears to have been removed or dismantled during construction of the submarine mining establishment. But during our shovel testing program, we were, we were able to confirm that the lower portion of this historic seawall is still intact underneath the beach. And you can see um, one of our test pits showing the remains of that seawall. So while the upper layers of it seem to have dis been dismantled, to accommodate the submarine mining establishment, the lower portions of it are still very much in situ. And I'll also mention that we conducted a ground penetrating radar survey of the parade grounds of Fort Charlotte in search of any evidence of the former Martello Tower. I think in fact, we were able to pick up evidence of this significant and historic feature but um, that'll have to be, I'll, ha I'll have to share the results of the GPR survey with you uh, another time <laughs> during another talk. In closing, the island's identity is once again being transformed. It's now almost like a retired veteran discharged from its duty as a sentinel, preventing enemy ships from gaining access to the inner harbor. Today, of course, it is a national historic site and part of the Halifax defense complex, but it is so much more than this. 
it can now have an infinite number of identities, depending on the individual visitor and the history they bring with them to the island. For me, it is a place of memory and reflection, a protected space that will remain relatively untouched as the city and the world continues to change around it. I hope that you've enjoyed my talk this evening and I truly hope that I have encouraged you to visit the island this summer or at some point in the future, take advantage of all of the work that Parks Canada has done to get the island ready for visitors and um, to really enjoy a part of the history of Shibuktuk of Halifax Harbor that for many, many years has been off limits to most of us. I truly hope that um, this information about the submarine mining establishment and its history will enhance your visit, that you will know exactly what you're looking at when you walk off that brand new wharf uh, and um, enter uh, and begin your journey of the island. There is so much more to see um, that has nothing to do with the submarine mining establishment, of course, um, with the, the military remains of Fort Charlotte and other aspects of the hot island's history that you can visit. But I really, I just really hope that this will give you some context and uh, allow you a better appreciation of the standing structures in the landing area and some of the archaeological resources that you actually can no longer see. I just want to say finally a thank you to Parks Canada, to Keith Mercer, to Rebecca Dunham, um, Wink, to all of the people who uh, reported us through this work. And a special thanks to my team members and crew members at Boreas Heritage who worked for months um, to expose these features, document and record and protect them. And they did just a phenomenal, fantastic job uh, in doing so. So I think some of them are actually uh, in the audience tonight. And I just want to say a very, very special thank you to all of the archaeologists at Boreas Heritage who really did a fantastic job on this project. And with that, uh, I will um, thank you all very much for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. I'll remind you what I said at the beginning. I am not an expert on military history or submarine mining establishments, but I'm very happy to answer any questions that I might be able to, if there are any. Thanks, Sarah. You could have fooled me. I thought you did really well. Awesome job. Um, and I think that everyone wants to go visit. So I think that goal <laughs> of yours has been accomplished. Um, we'll, yeah, just open up the discussion for some questions. I think we will stop the recording. Um,